Today, what I would like to do is give you an idea of my origins, and I want to say right away, this is not a cult of personality. I'm not Ron L. Hubbard or anything like this, <laughs> but I do feel it uh, may explain to you why I'm the weird character that I am, to give you some of the background uh, uh, of my life and the things that shaped um, where I, uh, I've come from. I, um, I was born in Vancouver in 1936. My mother and father were both born and raised in Canada. They were born in Vancouver early in the century. My grandparents on both sides came from Japan uh, early in the 20th century. So I'm, we consider me a third generation uh, Canadian then. And uh, the earliest memory I have from childhood was when dad took me down to a store downtown somewhere. We lived in Marple, which was out in the country at that time. Um, and we went to buy a tent because we were going to go camping together and it was one of the most exciting experiences of my life that's why it still burned into my brain I remember we set up a pup tent on the floor of the store and got in together and my dad and I lay there to make sure it was big enough and that was really to me the a very very um, seminal event for me because from that point my greatest memories of childhood are all of camping and fishing with my dad and you can imagine the area around here was very, very different. I mean, Marpole was on the edge of Vancouver, and uh, we could go fishing 20 or 30 miles out of town, and there were trout and, and uh, salmon, and I mean, it was a, a very different world. And that was my experience then until December 7th, 1941. And you all know that that's when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and for us, that meant our lives were changed forever because although I was a third generation Canadian, there was a tremendous amount of racism in British Columbia and this only catalyzed the fear that people had about these strange looking people that had such funny habits. And so the War Measures Act was enacted in 1942 and what the War Measures Act does is it allows government to suspend all rights of citizenship in a time of crisis. And so we w all of our rights were suspended. We were forbidden to congregate or travel or speak uh, openly. Our, uh, all our properties, were assets, were frozen. And uh, we were then basically rounded up because most Japanese Canadians, 22,000 Japanese Canadians, were on the west coast of Canada, primarily in the Vancouver area, but also on Vancouver Island and up around Prince Rupert because they were fishermen. And um, we were all herded into Hastings Park where they set up these uh, in the, the big buildings there, they set up beds for thousands and thousands of Japanese to be uh, corralled in and it just had little you know, uh, uh, sheets around the little areas where people slept and we were then fired out um, out east my family ended up in a town called Slocan City which was what they call a ghost town you know there were these Mining booms that happened in the late 1800s. Slocan was one of those silver mining towns that grew up and then there was nothing left. People left when the boom was over. And um, Slocan, I, I don't know how many thousand people poured into the Slocan Valley, but up and down from Slocan Lake there was Bay Farm and then Pop Off and Lemon Creek. There, these are little villages of Japanese Canadians that were set up with very quick uh, camps and tents where we were housed and um, so there I was at seven years old um, my dad was sent off to a road camp building the Trans Canada Highway and my mom had me and, and two sisters we were in a room that w used to be an old hotel so it was a very magnificent uh, place but it, it smelled of God knows these miners must have been up there that never sh never washed and we would be, every morning, we would wake up covered in, in bed bug bites. And if you know Japanese, for the Japanese, uh, cleanliness is like a religion. So the idea of us going to bed and being bitten by bed bugs, I am sure, for my mother, was just a horrifying thing. But, um, so everything was makeshift. But I was seven. And you know, it's funny, when you're a child, these kinds of things are kind of all an adventure. I was so clueless. 
I didn't realize there was something funny about everybody in the camps being Japanese like me. And um, there, were no, there was no school for a year and a half because they didn't have teachers. So when you're seven and you've got no school and you live in one of the most beautiful parts of the Rocky Mountains, for me it was just a joy because I didn't have to go to school. And I roamed through the forests and they were filled with wolves and bears and, and moose and it was just a marvelous experience. But the result is that when we did start school, I was skipped through three grades and passed into grade four all in one year. When I got to grade four, I didn't even know how to divide or multiply. I was just so much better than the other kids. They just said, you don't belong here and shoved me up. And Tara will attest to the fact that I have huge holes in my education <laughs> because I failed to learn all this basic stuff. Um, when I was in, in elementary school. But one thing that was really great is that when my dad joined us about a year after we were in camp, when I came home from school, he would always say, so what did you learn today? And he was really interested. And in order to tell him what I was doing, I had to explain it so he would understand it. If he couldn't understand it, he'd give me hell and say, what are you talking about? No, what do you mean? And I, now thinking about it, it was a great preparation for television because I think of my father as my audience and I'm tra taking very arcane scientific environmental stuff and making it accessible basically to my father. We were very poor and dad always said if you want to get ahead in Canada you have to be prepared to work. You have to work ten times harder than a white person. The key to your escaping our poverty is education. And so if he ever got mad at me, his biggest threat was, I'm going to pull you out of school and put you to work. And that was, for me, terrifying because getting an education was such an important part of, of uh, what I was or what I needed to do. And the other thing he said is, Orientals have a very hard time getting up and speaking in public. We're so shy and don't mean to insult. And whereas, Calvin, I don't mean to insult you, but this is what my dad always said. You know, Asians just are too... so. I want you to be a public speaker. And so Dad made me enter oratorical contests and trained me to become a public speaker. And that's one of the things I'm always grateful to him for. But I wasn't at the time because I, uh, every, well, the way he did it is every night I would have to write out my speech. And then every night after dinner he'd say, okay, in the basement. And then I'd have to get up and give the speech. And if I stumbled, I'd have to go back and start over again. And he might say, stop. Now that's a really important part. So you've got to slow down and then emphasize it. And then, and then I'd have to start over. Or he'd stop and say, you should move your hand like this. And, and then I'd start. So every night I'd be weeping in, in frustration. But by the time I was finished, you could wake me up at 3 in the morning and say, OK, give the speech. And I'd give it perfectly. <laughs> and, it, and it worked. I won a lot of uh, public speaking contests. In London, one of my classmates was an American. His dad was a dean of business at the uh, University of Western Ontario. And John, as an American, went down to college in the States after grade 12. And I was in grade 13 and met John at Christmas. And he raved about this school and said, you're the perfect guy to go to a place like that. So he got me to apply. And um, this is, it was called Amherst College in Massachusetts, a, a small liberal arts, all-male college. Now, I, there's no way I could have dreamt of going to a school like that, but they gave me a scholarship that was more than my father earned in a year. Now, before you get all excited, that was only $1,500, but back then that was what you could support a family of four on. And I'm always grateful to, to America because Amherst believed foreign students were... Uh, added to the education of American students and they were willing to pay foreign students to come to Amherst to add to the experience of Canadians and when I think of what we're doing in Canada today we're, we're bringing students from Japan and China and ripping them off by charging them high fees we're, you, we're setting up whole colleges based on recruiting Chinese and Japanese just to get their tuition we don't value them as people that add to our perspective. And, and I'm ashamed of that. I'm really proud that, that Amherst had this attitude. And I went to 
So it was a great experience for me. Amherst College made me uh, what I am in academically. It, it was a place where a quarter of the uh, students in my class were valedictorians in their class. I mean, it, the, all of the statistics. I roomed with, in, in four years, I roomed with five, uh, six people, and five of them became doctors or uh, professors with PhDs. I mean, it was just a very high unless maybe I only selected bright guys or something, I don't know. But uh, it was an impressive group of, of people. And at that time, in the 50s, uh, you could go from grade 13, two years of university, and get going to medical school at Western. So I was what all kids who did well in science at that time were pre-meds. So I went back to, to Western after my second year at Amherst and said, look, I want to go for four years, but do I have a chance at med school? And he said, yes, with your grades, you'll get into med school. So I was all set to go to medical school. And in my third year, I had to take a course in genetics. And it was required of all honor students. And I fell madly in love with genetics. I'd never encountered a biological discipline that was so precise mathematically and so elegant in its analysis. And so I called Western and turned down the, or told him I wasn't going to apply. And my mother cried for months <laughs> because her, doc her son could have been a doctor and instead decided to go and study fruit flies, which she couldn't <laughs> figure out. And anyway, I ended up then uh, going to the University of Chicago. And uh, uh, I got married at the end of graduation from Amherst. and. Uh, Although I'd had a course called Marriage and the Family, and I knew, you know, our plan was I would work, get my PhD, get a university position, then we'd start a family. She got pregnant the first year. So, so much for college education on family planning. Uh, so I end, we had to hustle through, and I finished uh, the degree in just over two and a half years, and went then on a postdoc to Oak Ridge National Laboratories in Tennessee. This is where the the atomic bomb was born. They set up the labs there to isolate uranium for the uh, atomic bombs. And afterward, after the war, they would used these old facilities to start a research um, area in biology to look at the ra effect of radiation on living organisms. But by the time I got there, they had expanded out to basic research in all areas, including a terrific group in uh, fruit fly genetics. But it was in in Oak Ridge, which was segregated, that I decided I wasn't going to stay in this country. I couldn't stand the discrimination that was going on. Uh, the people that I worked with in the in the lab, black people, they couldn't uh, go to the same go to church with white people in Oak Ridge. They couldn't go to a drive-in movie with white people. They couldn't use laundromats. I mean, it was segregated, and I. While Canada had thrown us in prison during the war, I felt Canada was smaller and I could, I could ha maybe have a, an effect in Canada and America was just too big and I, I didn't want to stay down there. So I took the first job I could get at the University of Alberta in Edmonton in 1962 and it was a wonderful position. Um, and two things happened at the University of Alberta that were very important to me. I was a hotshot geneticist. and. We knew about DNA and RNA and all this kind of stuff. And I was going to make my reputation in science when Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. How many here have never heard of Rachel Carson? Is there? Good. Good, good. <laughs> Rachel Carson is my great hero. Uh, and so this was a book about the unexpected effects of pesticides. And I can't tell you how radical this book was. Up until Rachel Carson's book, we assumed technology after World War II was wonderful. We embraced it. We thought controlling insects by DDT, what a great idea. Antibiotics, all these things were coming out of science. We all thought it was wonderful. And Rachel Carson's book really said, wait a minute now, we've got to look at the bigger picture. To me as a scientist, as I read Rachel Carson, it was like she'd punched me in the face because what she said is, you scientists are clever. Yes, you can make a chemical like DDT that kills insects, but you forget the lab is not the real world.
Now, I had always thought when you study something in the lab, it's a miniature part of the world out there. So you set up a little system here and you study the, the plants and the insects and the soil and then if you find nothing's wrong, then you extrapolate and say, oh, okay, the bigger world, it's fine. But what she said to me is, when you study something in the lab, you've created an artificial situation. It's simplified. You've got a plant, you've got an insect, you've got the air, you've got the soil. And then you control the temperature, the light, the humidity, everything's controlled. That's not the real world. And in the real world, everything is connected to everything else. So you think by the studies in the lab that you can now go out and spray DDT all over the fields. And what she said is you end up affecting the fish and the birds and human beings. And that to me was just such a revelation because when you grow something out in the open fields, now you've got the seasons, it rains, there are all kinds of the wind blows, all kinds of things happen that you don't understand when you study the situation in the lab. The lab is an artifact. And this is a fundamental thing when you see about biotechnology today and all of the new technologies. Scientists still haven't got the message that Rachel Carson gave. The other thing was that when you spray out in the real world, what she discovered was, well, she didn't, scientists discovered, DDT may go out in the real world at a very low concentration, but bacteria and fungi and, and insects will absorb that. Some won't be killed. And then they'll be eaten by bigger things. And at each level up the food chain, you concentrate it. Now, we now know this is called biomagnification up the food. In 1962, we didn't know about biomagnification until Rachel Carson began to report on it in Silent Spring. Even if we had very careful attempts to reproduce the real world, how could we have ever discovered something like biomagnification? You can't. It's only when you do it out in the real world that knew we didn't know there was a phenomenon called biomagnification. And that's why we have to always be aware of these enormous hazards of extrapolating from the lab. And never was that more relevant than today with biotechnology. Biotechnologists have not got the message that Rachel Carson uh, gave us. And because of Rachel Carson, although I went on and had a career in genetics, I could never look at just what we were doing in the lab. I had to look at the, the bigger picture. <laughs>